Hi, I'm, I'm Rory, um, this is Newcastle University, about to enter my third year of PhD. Um, so yeah, cool. So today I'm going to look at uh, the reason which French Epigon managed its estrangement from the uh, USA, particularly at the Bill of the West Coast. Now, Epigon is, is generally considered to be uh, an American phenomenon, and that's for good reason. But it's also, it's important to remember, it's a transnational movement as well, both its origins and in its, uh, its influence. Uh, so a variety of, of mediums were, were important in allowing the formation of, of transnational community. Within this paper, I'd like to focus on the idea of uh, what I'm calling travel songs, but maybe some of else is already using that term. Uh, and by this, I mean a, a song that invokes a sense of voyage or discovery of distant places. Um, and I want to consider how imagining travel through music helps uh, form a transnational community. So this presentation will be split roughly into two halves. I will first contextualise Hippodrum within wider French societal and cultural trends uh, in order to offer insight into why Hippodrum was and why and how Hippodrum was found to be attractive for French youth. Then I will delve more deeply into my argument concerning the travel song through a case study of Johnny Hyde's adaptation of San Francisco, uh, most popularly known uh, by Scott McKenzie. So uh, Happy Drum in France was actually a lot bigger than it's uh, it's been recognized and has been recognized. Um, here are just some examples. We've got uh, Jean Le Garbe de Jean Fass, uh, which is published in 1929. Uh, and uh, Michel Lanzaro went to the States and explored the heavy phenomenon. Uh, there were uh, TV shows, discussions between serious cultural commentators and hippies about whether, about what the movement was, if it was good or not. And uh, there was music inspired by the hippie movement. Uh, hippie Dome would act as a disruptive factor for French youth culture, uh, providing ammunition for intergenerational tensions and the pluralization of. Uh, youth culture. So the first way in which uh, Hippodrome made itself feel dis disruptive is intergenerationally. Uh, a new concept of youth had been under construction since in France since the end of the Second World War. In response to the massive structural, cultural, and emotional damages with which France had to contend, there sprung a desire for newness and innocence. Youth was situated as France's potential for a revitalization and renewal. Uh, and were even often presented as being the salvation for the folly of their elders. So at France, this time you get the nouveau vague of, of, of literature and, and cinema, and uh, uh, music came a bit later, but there's this emphasis on youth. Um, so at this point, youth identity in France was to a large extent imposed as a part of a national project, and thus was an identity constructed as much for the youth uh, as by the youth. Uh, this construction would be important for the uh, changes that would happen in the 60s. Uh, the second important factor uh, is the de development of the genre Ye yeah, yeah, and the associated uh, cultural community of the Copan. Uh, so this happened in the mid to late first half of the 60s. Um, Ye yeah, Ye yeah was the dominant musical genre and Copan was, was the uh, cultural community associated with it. And it represents as France, France's first major popular culture-oriented youth culture. It was very establishment-driven, and in order to avoid the wrath of parents, uh, you know, would make society acceptable. And this is epitomized the ideology of the Copan, which means body or friend or pal. Uh, and uh, central ideology of the, this community was, was that everyone was a friend, and you know, was, France was made of a homogenous, uh, nationwide movement of, of pals, all this drawing this music together. Um, so there was you know, a distinct lack of a plural identity in youth culture at this point, and a, a lack of intra-generational tension at this point. Uh, the scholars, I would say these things very badly, Heide Fehrenbach and Uta Poiget note that America has a history of offering European youth alternative models of identification that allow the shaping of new identities. Uh, the French interest in Hippodrome follows this pattern as a way for 
uh, French youth to differentiate themselves both inter and intragenerationally. Uh, I'm just going to hear, I think distance is very important in this uh, uh, relationship as it allows uh, a foreignness or an exotic uh, element to the, uh, uh, the relationship which makes it culturally and politically attractive. And I'll pick up on that later. Um, a demonstration of, of the way that Epidem crept into intergenerational conflict. So the, uh, the French sociologist and historian Henri Mendras uh, stated that girls wore trousers or mini skirts in order to irritate their mothers. Boys let their hair grow long and cultivated beards because their fathers had short hair and were pretty shaven. So in this way, it's kind of quite similar to, to Anglophone manifestations of counterculture. But it's, it's important to know that this was happening in France as well. Similarly, Hepidome allowed a pluralization of, of uh, youth culture, and this started to disrupt the, the boundaries of youth culture set by Yaya and the Copan. The French perception of Hepidome's rebellious and challenging nature was, <coughs> was not based solely on the ideology of, of Hepidome, but also relied upon France's uh, relationship with the USA. So France has had a long and difficult history with the USA, and often been <coughs> positioned as being a, a love-hate, love-hate relationship with it. Uh, a French studies historian Richard Kaiser suggests that this relationship is founded on the idea that the USA is perceived as a social model of the future for France. Uh, the vision of the future that America offers is exciting for the French. You know, there's uh, access to, to modernity, to consumer goods, to progress. At the same time, it terrifies them. Uh, there's a fear of loss of French national identity, uh, cultural exceptionalism, and uh, raised concerns about hyper capitalism and uh, alienation. The figure of the Hepi was cleverly constructed in order to allow the French youth to, um, to navigate the relationship. The rebellious American youth were constructed by the French as anti American. Uh, the French journalist and sociologist Edgar Morin exposed this duality when he stated that he was attracted to American youth because they, this is a quote, they revolt against the American way of life, end quote. And similarly, in 1970, another journalist, Jean-François Rebel, opened his book, um, one of my favorite opening lines ever, um, with the line, quote, the revolution of the 20th century will take place in the United States, end quote. So by situating the figure of the hippie as an eternal lover, the French youth could access the choice aspects of American culture while still critiquing America. Okay, so Hepitone allowed had three dimensions I just mentioned there. So there's intergenerational conflict that uh, rubbed against societal values. There's provided inter intergenerational conflict through the pluralization of youth culture. And um, it fed into this long history of uh, using American culture against uh, America. French youth were nonetheless very conscious of their distance from the USA, and despite the increased desire to travel that emerged throughout the 1960s, having real contact with American Hippodrome was a far-fetched dream for many. Um, thus, from the mid-60s, as, you know, magazines and travelogues were increasingly published to deal with this dream. Uh, in 1966, Rock and Folk was first published, which was the first uh, rock-based uh, French magazine. This was followed two years later by Best, and then countercultural publications began to emerge in the 70s, such as Actuelle. These magazines would break down the music, provide interviews, explain the culture, and give dispatches from uh, journalists in the USA. Uh, similarly, there were a bunch of books published and, and a few television programs. Music was an important way for French youth to construct an imagined community with American youth. In the same way that travel literature allows the reader to imagine uh, a voyage, uh, the travel song allows the listener to engage in a form of imagined travel. Uh, in many ways, this uh, reminds me of Anahi Kasabian's idea of distributed tourism. Uh, through this concept, Kasabian explains how world music allows the listener to experience a form of tourism that that allows listeners to explore the, the there, the location that music is supposed to evoke uh, from the here, the location of the listener, this exploration of the there from the here uh, is mimicked in the travel song. 
I, I think there are, there are important differences in, in the type of music she talks about and that I'm looking at, but this very pure aspect uh, has lots of parallels. Uh, Johnny Halliday's adaption of uh, Scott McKenzie's San Francisco is a notable example of this. At least in 1967, San Francisco hit the market as uh, France was swept by the heavy craze. Um, simultaneously, he adopted the heavy fashion, despite only the year before mocking the, the heavy movement aesthetics and philosophy. So I'll play a little clip. She was a lady of San Francisco. Was he very Song way too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, a comparative analysis of the lyrics sung by Halliday and the lyrics sung in the in Mackenzie's version reveals some reveals the ideological differences involved mm -hmm. in the production of the song, <laughs> and therefore the perceived ideological perception of these songs of the audience. One notable level of difference is the sense of inclusion and exclusion that's present that's present in the two lyrics. So in Mackenzie's version, he sings. Uh, wear some flowers in your hair. I've got the next little over, sorry about that. Wear some flowers in your hair and tells us that you're going to meet some gentle people there. The listeners involved in the Gaines song, they are told that if they choose to come to San Francisco, they will be welcomed and integrated into the community. On the other hand, how these lyrics are more detached. He says that you will see people gentle and kind and you will see flowers in their hair. The frequency of which C occurs in Halliday's adaption places the listener in the position of an observer, or someone removed from what is happening. Further, Halliday actively names people of San Francisco as hippies, a word not mentioned in Mackenzie's version, and by doing so, situates a hippie as external. Through the act of hippie, the, through, the, through the act of naming, the hippie becomes an other and assumes an identity that must be overcome in order to be integrated. Halliday's adaption not only focuses on exclusion, and in fact, he does offer the listener a sense of potential inclusion. Um, Halliday mentions the possibility of hippies becoming your friends, so this listener shares the same values as the hippies, and he sings, just like them, you say no to hate, to the passions we are friends on this earth. Yet the biggest statement of inclusion comes in the closing lines. In Paris, like San Francisco, we will see lots of people like them. Now, this line is more equivalent to Mackenzie's version. And in fact, it seems uh, distinct to this one adaption. I uh, have people with Italian versions and with other French versions of this. Not, there's not a Latin line like this anywhere I can find. There is. Someone knows of something, please tell me. So, um, suddenly, Bliss is transported uh, from the sunny paradise of San Francisco to the Francophone capital of Paris. Paris uh, is becoming an equivalent, even an equal, of San Francisco. It's implied that Paris will embrace the same qualities and values as San Francisco and will be populated by the same sorts of people. The musical changes that existed uh, between Halliday's adaption and McKenzie's versions are also important. Um, and both audiences, I should mention this, audiences are aware of both versions um, and indeed the uh, Scott McKenzie's version actually lasted a lot longer in the charts than Halliday's version did. Uh, so, one of the differences is the absence of hand claps. Uh, with it. In McKenzie's version, this signifies a sense of community, something we can all do, and without any training, and implies a physical proximity. Uh, its removal of Halliday's version uh, suggests a greater level of estrangement. And but one of the most distinctive changes. Uh, in Halliday's adaption is a toying down of the electric guitar and introduction of a much more prominent organ role. Reasons for this are unclear. Halliday has, has used a um, dominant guitar in the past. 
Nevertheless, in the bubble cause, nevertheless, in the past, we keep preceding uh, the final runs, uh, racings in Paris, like San Francisco. Uh, there was a, a spot for the guitar, the carbon's the uh, prominent instrument in place of the organ. I'll play that now. Uh, While following the same protocol as Mackenzie's version, Hardy's adaption emphasizes the electric bass and exaggerates the guitar through uh, distortion, of that's intentional or accidental there, and volume in a way that juxtap juxtaposes with the rest of Hardy's adaption. These few bars represent quasi rebellion within the uh, internal aesthetics of the song, and when considered in the context of shifting from San Francisco to Paris, uh, transplant the rebellion. Uh, musically. Uh, living up to Kaisel's argument, the USA acts as a social model of the future for France, and um, within the song, how they present San Francisco as a possible future for Paris, by placing the listener as an outsider to the romantic, idealized, exotic, hippie community of San Francisco, a sense of alienation and estrangement emerges. This creates within the listener a growing desire for integration into this community, uh, which is released at the end of the song, when both the musical, musical and lyrical shifts bring San Francisco to Paris. Uh, throughout the adaption, there's a careful management of similarity and difference. The hippie, the American hippie is always presented as other, as different from a French listener. Yet at the same time, this otherness is built on cultural lines. And this means that the otherness of the hippie is surmountable, and Halliday makes this clear. To conclude, due to its distance from the USA, French hippiedom had to navigate its peripheral position and find points of identification to create a sense of community and inclusion. At the same time, the figure of the hippie, the figure of the hippie had to maintain its difference in order for its political radicalness and cultural attractiveness um, to be effective. The travel song was one way in which of navigating this relationship and maintaining its balance. Um, this is one of the strengths of the travel song, allows a sense um, of or, or the potential for inclusion while maintaining uh, exoticization and distance. Um, the hippie and San Francisco could both be exotic and accessible. Indeed, this balance would be fundamental to uh, the <coughs> early years of French counterculture, from the mid 60s to, to early 70s, um, as America remained a common center. However, uh, from late 60s onwards, this would all start to decline as France began to see itself more as a countercultural centre in its own right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? I, I have one or two. Go on. Um, yeah, two questions. The uh, added line in Halliday's version still. Still keeps that phrasing. We will, we will see. It still kind of has that outside other disorder. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the crucial part here is the future tense. We will. It's going to happen. Yeah. But before it's just we, we, like you're going somewhere. You will see. But then when it moves to Paris, I think you're saying you know, France is in the process of becoming. Right. So it's still, it's still, it uh, still has that kind of that outsider observer phrasing. Yeah, I, I, I guess. Which is, I guess what I'm. I agree. I, I, to me, it says um, feels like it's beginning to happen. Well, um, is it still in the simple future? Is it in, in French? Is it? Yes, it tends the same. It's still in the simple future. Yeah. It's, yeah, but it's not the best reading I can have of it. I, I mean, I, I agree. It does have. There's still the. Um, there's still that large of this difference here. Yeah. But I think there's a, a potential for transformation included in that at the same time. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Rory, for that, uh, Dan. Um, I, I just wanted to ask, uh, first of all, just as just, just a point of, of reference, mm -hmm. is, um, is Bach's essay on the hippies, I think it's in mythologies, isn't it? Is, um, is that still regarded as, uh, as useful to this research? or? Yeah, well, okay. I don't think it's in mythologies. 
I'm cast Cootie Cottrell. Um, oh, wait. I, at least I, I, I don't think it might be. Um, for me, it's important that he was talking about it. Um, he's a bit disparaging. Yeah. Uh, there are debates about authenticity going on. Um, it's only a couple of pages long, bro. It is. I mean, does it? Would you say it's now regarded as, as passe, or, or, or is, is his uh, critique still worthwhile? I mean, I'm, I'm, it's been a while since I've read it, so I can't. Yeah. I don't know what's that. Um, okay. Just just one on point, if I may, just, just to connect with, uh, with Sarah's paper. It's interesting that uh, Kerouac, as uh, a symbol of the birth of the counterculture, whatever we make of that statement, um, also grew up as a French speaker mm -hmm. and is interviewed on French television <coughs> in the 1960s. He's a problem figure because he is rejecting much of what, what the counterculture stands for, even though he's seen as the, the font of some of its wisdoms. Um, ha have you thought about problematizing Kerouac in relationship to France, the hippies, and so on? Um, I've come across lots of references to Kerouac. Uh, he was obviously important. He was actually very important in 1775 when France was. It's more of an internally faced counterculture as, as well, actually. But um, it wouldn't really fit in the scope of my project. So, my, my PhD is, is, is looking at how France during with an emphasis of countercultural edge here, and between about 66 and 75, managed its relationships with um, itself and other nationalities. So, the hippies here represent the US. But I'm also going to look at Franco Anglo exchanges, relationship with Europe and stuff. Um, I mean, I think it'd be interesting to do it. I don't think it would fit in my project. Do you know, I mean, that's how you start the old point. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Um, yeah, I apologise if this is outside the scope of your research, Tom, if it is. But um, it just when I was listening to it, that was really interesting. Thank you. Um, when, when I was listening to it, I was also thinking about what else is going on counterculturally in the States at the time, mm -hmm. particularly with uh, civil rights, black pride, etc. And I was wondering if that um, manifested itself in France as well. Yeah. And if so, how? Okay, a um, really strong example of this is in free jazz. Yeah. Uh, so, free jazz had a huge following in, in France at this point. Um, I should also mention that France was obviously, well, has had a has long welcomed African Americans. Much more of and they've welcomed uh, their own uh, colonial subjects. Um, and this goes back to the, the, the point I made about the use of American culture against America. So jazz has often been a long way of uh, having a choice aspect to America while critiquing it. Um, so this does a long history. So, the 60s were a large contingent of African Americans in uh, Paris, the arts and suburbs of Chicago. I can't remember who else, but uh, there was a whole third world just reading of uh, the civil rights, uh, and then the Black Panthers, and, and so on. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a book, I don't know if you've read it, Free Jazz Black Power. Uh, I can send you the reference if you want. Um, so, Free Jazz was a big way of doing it, but I've, I found some other references to uh, other forms of black music being associated with. Uh, called it at that point, um, but it was, it was mainly for jazz, yeah. about relationships. It struck me when you were talking about America representing modernity, because actually what you just, that point you just made, that France would welcome African Americans more than its own colonial subjects, that seems to repeat itself in many, you know, European yeah. countries. Um, I recently <laughs> saw a great paper on jazz in Portugal, in okay. Lisbon, and you know, the presenter was making exactly the same point, that African Americans touring in Lisbon represented this modernity, mm -hmm. um, whereas um, Portuguese colonial subjects from Angola, Mozambique, what have you, yeah. were um, you know not welcomed at all. I I feel there's there's definitely something going on here with a greater focus on internal lovers. I mean, I mentioned there that way which American youth were cast as internal lover. There's interest in the African Americans as internal lover. 
I'm currently working on a chapter in the Folk Revival, which focuses on France and the Terra Lava. Um, so I don't know, I think there's a bigger picture going on there. But, I have, a, I have a question about. Oh, sorry, go on. Yeah, um, yeah that was re really interesting. I, I, I was wondering, did you maybe think about the relationship and take a class conscious approach to this? And I was thinking back to Paul Willis's Profane Cultures, 1978, you know, euphemistically called Bikers and Hippies, mm -hmm. which kind of embraces the notion of travel and the notion of hippiedom. And uh, when I talk about class consciousness, I was thinking about France in the 1960s uh, of being a Let's be really rude. A peasant country and was embracing tradition. Was starting to embrace uh, modern uh, class structures, and that the hippies would find traction there because essentially it's one. It's just about the only subculture that is middle class, and therefore it has a tolerance to it. And I just wondered whether there might be a, a you know something to look at there, and and think about those dialectical associations of, of, of how subcultures. You, have dialectical relationships with the items that that, that they use. I think um, Jameson refers to that as the uh, an incredulity towards late, you know, the detritus of late day capitalism, which is a bit silly. But, but I was thinking specifically how they use songs, how they mm. use music, clothing, shoes, silly movable sets, mm. forms of transport, and you know, all, all, all the rest of it. You know. Just not really a question, more of a rambling like all my questions. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't thought too much about it. I mean, so the the, the version I showed John Halliday is obviously he's a very he's a very popular figure in mm. France. So this is sort of the mainstream adaptation of it, which uh, is important to acknowledge. But I don't think it removes completely the I mean political cultural edge of the symbols. Mm. Um, so, I mean, there's obviously a class thing going on with one thing, who admires travel? There are very few people who can go to the States and report back. Um, and, you know, they tend to end up, well, if they're not, if they're established already, they get paid enough money to do it. But the other journalists, it sort of ends up like being the hippies or defending the hate Ashbury with middle class parents or something, but they just live on nothing. Um, until they need to go home. <laughs> um, and there's, there's definitely, there's a consumer culture, mm -hmm. so that's definitely part of it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll think about it more. That's, yeah. Thank you. Might be worth just revisiting um, uh, but, you know, profane cultures and just look at it. So. It, it's the kind of definitive book on hippies, so it, it, it comes out of the Centre for Contemporary Cultural Studies under Stuart Hall's direction in 1978. It was actually uh, Paul Willis's PhD. Okay. You know, so it's it's kind of a great starting point. But he he does a, a you know looks at a working class counterculture like heavy metal bikers and compares that to against a middle class subculture like hippies and and and, and look. You know, yeah. Look at what they share and what, what's, what's different. So it'd be quite a useful start. Yeah. Point. I know it's based in England. I understand there's flaws in my. No, no, it's. it's I mean, yeah, I'll look into it. Once we have a bit it fits in with national awareness. Mm. Um, but I'll look into it. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I just. So you talk about national awareness, and that's. Great, but there's a regional otherness that is a problem with the song, San Francisco. So we, I, I like that you were bringing in Kasabian's um, yeah. sort of structural, you know, listening here, about there. That song was written from there, about here. Yeah. So, so it's, uh, it's received very differently in San Francisco than it was in LA, mm -hmm. and it was written for a very okay. particular purpose, which was to publicize the Monterey Pop Festival oh, okay. in 1967. So, um, and so it's written by LA people about San Francisco. Oh. Um, and it caused a lot of mayhem in San Francisco because all these young, you know, listless people just showed up in San Francisco with flowers in their hair. And so when was that song actually recorded? So, um, by Holiday? I think it was 67. So just so the same summer or after um, the summer? Or? I think it was, at least I was found records in charts, it was towards the end of the year. Okay. So Mackenzie had been in the charts for a couple of months and then. Right. 
So it was kind of post summer of love, yeah. but still about. But it's not so, it's, so, so it's weird. It's get to, to me. So I sort of saw that as, as like a simulacrum. So it's it's a song about a place that doesn't exist yeah. by people who weren't in the place itself. So <laughs> I, mean, I find it complicated and interesting for that very reason. I mean, one difficulty is it's talked sort of about what happy dumb means in other countries, and I feel like even when you look at San Francisco or the States or whatever, it does it's incredibly touristic. I think when it comes to France, it's very fragmented. You get bits and bobs here, you know, like there's our first French um, big rock festival, but at least bigger on the front, you'll see it find references to Indian uh, uh, clothing shops. Um, but it doesn't seem to be as unified, it doesn't seem to be a unified set of signifiers. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, but you bring up all. You raise a lot of really interesting, really interesting points. Well, actually, yeah, actually, I should introduce these ones on that. That got something in my head actually. And, and the way that France looks at like, the East Coast compared to the West Coast at this point is really interesting. Yeah. Um, and there's one journey where this was generally I see people from New York through to Hollywood to San Francisco. And it's like a general process of more glamorous. Yeah. Um, I feel like New York is more attached to folk and beat, yeah. while they saw San Francisco is almost like an Orient. I think I, I, in the last chapter I talked about an Orient, but Orient. Orient, I can't say it. Orientalism. Orientalism of San Francisco. Yeah. There's an interesting point also at which. Um, Madison Avenue, you know, sort of the New York kind of publicity machinery decides that they were the ones who invented, you know, psychedelia as a style. Yeah. <laughs> kind of. It's so deciding. So there's a there is a every city, every region obviously had its its own history about you know its own narrative on how they adapted some of these some of these things, and they're they're interesting to pick apart and to fit against each other. Yeah, I mean, this is something I'm, I'm really interested in how. But I think something that often gets overlooked is reception. Yeah. Uh, I think. Because often when you see it, you might see on America, so many French charts, but for American hegemony, won't la la la. But, you know, there's a lot recorded in why songs are attractive. Yeah. And it's, it's often attached to ideas of, of place. But so. If um, if Hippie Dem kind of hit London at a different time as well, and sort of the psychedelic mm -hmm. underground in London, and sort of the UFO club, and yeah. uh, was there any contact between? Was there any points of reference between? Were there any points of reference um, between London and Paris? Yeah. So the word, the word, I, I used to buckle down on this. this next chapter, I'm hoping to write. Um, we obviously there's Serge Gainsbourg, Gainsbourg and Jane Birkin. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that you know, Robert Plant and, and Jimmy Page. Oh, well, Jimmy Page definitely played on some Halloween mm -hmm. records. And uh, Gansburg often went to London to record. Um, so I know there's circulation going on. Yeah. Um, it's an easier and a cheaper travel point of travel between. Yeah, but I think I think at the same time it's less sexy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Although, you know, I've got packed lined up to read a bunch of articles, which are dispatches from London. Um, there's one thing about why uh, British music is better or something. Yeah. Uh, It'd be also interesting to, to see, I'm sorry, uh, to, to see the roots of, of drug trafficking. So, how the, how, the, how the drugs got to Paris and did they come from San Francisco? Yeah, well, I don't know where I start to find it out. But, I, I Ask around, that. scratch the surface, yeah. somebody will tell you. I'll give you the number of a guy. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a beam. <laughs> 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 <Wow. laughs> well, one of the big criticisms, because something that happens when people write to the US is often as a collective to the French, yeah. what's going on in France. So, you guys have understood that, and uh, this is actually what's all about. All about. One thing we should ask will criticize this fact a lot for is the censorship about discussion of drugs. Mm -hmm. um, so that was not that because at this time, yeah. French media was controlled by the state. Um, 
Or maybe just nobody in France was taking drugs in the 60s. There was definitely. That could happen. No, well, <laughs> there's, there's it's an interesting hypothesis. <laughs> I, I don't no know, drugs in Paris. I don't know how popular our Steve was, but there was yeah. a scandalous photo shoot in 66 in Magazine of Combat, and a, big, a girl tripping out. Um. Um, but there's lots of references to to weed and stuff. Sure. But right. LSD, I don't find it come up, up as much. Because right. at 67 is still the era of the famous LSD manufacturers. So. Yeah, and things are really, like, I really took off as sort of an underground movement a few years later. Like, I feel the si uh, late 60s are sort of the coalescing of influences. Mm. Then about 70s onwards, it starts to... Yeah. Kind of yeah. And then we get May 68 as an epistemic moment in the Foucault yeah. 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 It's yeah. kind of, yeah, it's a, there's, there's an awful lot to work with, so I mean, it's, I, I'm, yeah. I realize we're, we're going way over, but I'm, the, those of you who joined late, we don't have a third paper, which is why we're going later, I'm really sorry. Um, we're freestyling. Yeah, we're just kind of, you know, time exists in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> the University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.